We're joined today by Senator Wayne Fontana. Senator, you're sponsoring a proposal that would require all of our election to take place via paper ballot. Can you tell us a little bit about your bill? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, the bill uh, would be would say that all elections held on, after, on or after November 1st, 2020 would be done by mail-in. Um, so that's something that um, that's done in a lot of states, um, including uh, Oregon, which is my bill's patterned after, after the Oregon bill. Uh, Oregon started mail-in ballots in 1999. Um, so uh, those, those uh, this would start then in November or after November. Uh, moving forward, obviously, we'd love to do it sooner, or at least I would uh, love to do it sooner because of the uh, uh, virus that's out there. Uh, but I think if we can get it started uh, November 1st this year, that'd be great. Is your legislation solely done as a response to perhaps your concerns you've heard because of the pandemic, or are there other reasons for doing this? Oh, there's other reasons. Actually, I wrote this uh, before the virus started. Uh, once the virus hit, uh, our governor uh, sort of endorsed the mail-in at that point. Uh, I'm from Allegheny County. Uh, my chief executive there uh, embraced it. Also, uh, going forward into uh, this now June 2nd uh, election, I'm hoping that we can, you know, move forward with it and, and do it permanently uh, in this in the state of uh, or Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, as you just sort of referenced, um, Allegheny County Executive um, has actually called for all registered voters in Allegheny County to receive a paper ballot. What are you hearing from constituents? How's that being received? Oh, I think uh, constituents love the fact if, uh, that you can mail out either the application with a self or prepaid envelope to mail it right back. Um, what the chief executive would like to do in the future is to mail the ballot itself with a prepaid uh, envelope to send it back. This way, you don't have to worry about whether someone has internet or doesn't have internet, uh, that sort of thing, you get the ballot, you send, you know, at your convenience, you fill it out uh, and you send it in uh, at your convenience. So I think uh, it's something that it's uh, on the move here, uh, obviously in Pennsylvania, but throughout the country. What kind of concerns do you hear from county election bureaus specifically about in-person voting? I think part of the issue here is to educate folks up about how it works because you get you, you do get to push back about fraud and, and what could happen um, uh, with a paper ballot. But again, as I mentioned, uh, Oregon's been doing it since 1999. There's five other states that do it completely, and there's about 28 states that actually do it partially. Um, they've managed to keep the fraud to a very, 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 very low minimum. Uh, so it's not a big threat. We have a paper trail. Uh, you can do audits on it. You can do, you can track it. There's a lot of things with technology barcodes. There's a lot of things you can do to make sure that it's done properly. Not to say that the envelope itself, there's an envelope inside an envelope. Uh, there has to be a signature. There has to be a birth date. There has to be the last four numbers of social security. So there's a lot of things that are done uh, to make sure that it, it is secure. How would a paper only election affect election staffing needs? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that's one of the reasons I think our chief executive uh, is on board. We we here in Allegheny County had to look for new machines. The cost of those machines is out of this world. Um, not only that, is that also pool workers, uh, all that would be saved. All that money would be saved. In fact, I, I had a conversation with him about that. Would it be cheaper to mail or cheaper to have the machines and the pool workers? And without a doubt, it would be cheaper uh, just to do the mail. What kind of response is your bill receiving from other lawmakers? I'm, I'm getting a, a, a mediocre response, to be honest. Um, obviously, um, some folks look at it as a political thing, where I, I understand there's some polling out there nationwide, and 67% of the Democrats uh, like it, only 49% of the Republicans like it. I don't quite get that. I, you know, Some folks look at it as a way to increase the vote, which I think it is, that would help Democrats. Um, others say, well, Republicans like to suppress the vote, so they don't, wouldn't want something that increases uh, citizens, the gives them the opportunity to have their voice heard easily and more conveniently. So I don't know if that's the case. I think a lot of folks, uh, Utah, for example, is a Republican state, and they use it. So I don't know that, I think it's about education and make, making folks feel comfortable. Where's your bill in the legislative process? Well, it was just uh, recently, uh, 
refer to, to state committee, um, state government committee uh, in, in the Senate. So we'll see if we get a hearing uh, or some sort of uh, discussion debate in committee, um, you know, moving forward. As you know, we have a lot on our plate with uh, the, the coronavirus and, and uh, budget season coming here uh, in, in June. So there's a lot of things to, to be considered. And again, this, this could be considered sort of after uh, we get through some of this stuff because uh, it, it's to go in effect November. Certain recreational activities will now be allowed. Um, and also, as of May 8th, certain counties are going to be designated into the yellow phase, which will ease some additional restrictions. What are your thoughts on the, the timing and the pace that the state is starting to open up? Well, you know, my, I guess my personal feelings is we need more testing um, to, to open up everything uh, the way it was. Uh, and, and we don't have that. So you have to be very careful about how you open up, who you open up, um, moving forward. It has to be safe. So a lot of industries, I think, that maybe were, you know, the waiver system that happened was confusing in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that uh, there are there are uh, occupations out there and professions that can open and be uh, socially distancing, uh, mass disinfecting, and can do it well. Um, I think when you talk about realtors and, and uh, uh, car dealerships, those types of things, they are opening up partially right now. I think eventually in the next couple of weeks, they may open up completely. Um, part of the uh, issue is that when you open one county and not the other county, folks will be traveling possibly back and forth. So that's, that's difficult. But I think what's happened is I think the folks out there, our citizens realize that this is serious, that this is not a hoax. This is something that, that's, that has taken more lives than the Vietnam War. And if we don't do this right, there'll be a lot more deaths. Until we get a vaccine, we have to do, do all the safety things that we could possibly do. Separately, you recently issued a statement regarding the $3.9 billion in federal stimulus that Pennsylvania is to receive. How is that money uh, going to be determined for how it gets distributed? And are there specific areas that you would like to see that, see a share of that money? Well, that's that's another great question because that money will certainly uh, be needed uh, without a doubt in so many different areas. But we all have our priorities, obviously, to, and we're all going to weigh in. I know uh, our caucus, the, the uh, Senate Democratic Caucus, has gone through uh, and had an exercise. And hey, what do you what do you think your prior what our prior priorities should be? I know the governor will weigh in. So were the other caucuses. So we're going to have a a big discussion about that. We have to help our frontline workers. I think that's at the top of the list, how we do that. Uh, we have to make sure they're safe. We have to make sure they get the equipment they, they need. We have to make sure they get paid sick leave if they do get sick. I think they, we have to make sure that they're not losing anything when it comes to housing. Uh, those, those type of things are so important uh, as we move forward. So I think it, that for us, uh, they'll be at the top of the list and whatever their needs are. And we'll be, you know, determ determining that in the next uh, month, I'm sure. What do you anticipate working on as the Senate returns to session? I think most of most of the things are going to be uh, on, on the virus and, and that that sort of thing. The econ the budget is going to be front and center. Uh, the question there to to your previous uh, question about uh, the the fund care fund uh, money, how much of that can be used um, to for our budget. And, and one of the conditions of that, by the way, is not to fill a hole in the budget. It has to be used for uh, coronavirus type uh, issues. So the question becomes, how many billions are we going to be in the hole and how do we fill it and how do we balance it uh, going forward? Do we do a partial budget, a full budget? Do we come, you know, do one and come back in a couple months and see how the revenues pick up as the, as the economy uh, reopens? Those are all the questions, and they're going to take a lot, I'm sure, most of our time going forward. Senator Wayne Fontana, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. Take care. We have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Voting is a civic duty. Voters are an integral part in government operations. When I run for office, you can be my campaign manager. Do you have a child curious about civic engagement? Support their passion with PCN Civics 101, a free online resource presented by the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Easy to watch videos take learners into the Capitol to see how our state government functions, meant to enhance your child's classroom studies. Go to PCNTV.com to start watching. PCN Civics 101, 
Teaching Pennsylvania Politics and Policy. We're joined today by Pennsylvania's Auditor General, Eugene DePasquale. You recently agreed to conduct an audit of the Department of Community and Economic Development's waiver program for businesses that wanted to remain in operation during the coronavirus pandemic. What will be involved in this audit? Well, for starters, hopefully everyone out there is doing okay, staying safe. Um, and when it came to uh, uh, this business waiver program, we all know why this, at least what happened in the beginning, which was the governor ordered a lot of business shutdowns due to trying to uh, stop the spread of the coronavirus. And they created where some businesses were allowed to stay open, some weren't. And then they had a waiver process where businesses could ask to remain open if they were told to be closed. And one of the things we're going to look for in this audit was, was it a fair process? What, you know, we're going to make sure that was everybody treated fairly, regardless of who you knew or, or what type of operation you had, making sure that the rules were the same for everybody falling through. Again, mate, yeah, and again, that's what we're mostly looking through. Obviously, there'll be a lot of details that we were working through to make sure that we're getting to that. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure it's a fair process and were the you know, proper criteria considered. There's two reasons for this. Number one is hopefully this isn't going to be extending that much further. But if it is, we want to make sure that it's a fair process while it's taking place, if it needs to be. Broadly speaking, moving forward, I believe, and I, this isn't just some insight on me, that this may not be the last time as a society we go through something like this again. We want to also make sure that we're better prepared uh, for the next time this may happen. The administration had said that they were focused on dealing with the pandemic and that open records requests would basically take a back seat to that. Will that have any impact on your timeline, what your timeline will look like and how long it'll play out to, to conduct this audit? Now, I had a discussion with the governor. He made it clear that if there's anybody on his team that's not cooperating, he wanted to know personally, um, and that would be rectified immediately. I anticipate uh, 100% cooperation. Separately, Senate Republicans yesterday had sent a subpoena to the governor and basically looking into the same waiver process that you will be uh, conducting your audit. Does that subpoena situation have any impact on your ability to conduct the investigation? It will have no impact on the audit at all. That'll be between the administration and the uh, Senate Republicans. On another topic, pandemic-related unemployment has um, right. caused our unemployment compensation system to, to have a, a much higher uh, number of claims yeah. than typical. Yeah. Judging from your past audits of that system, are there things that maybe stuck out to you as contributing to the current backlog of cases? Well, this is, you know, there's some things we all have predicted right in life and some things we predicted wrong. This is one where I wish I was wrong and turned out we were 100% correct on. We did an audit that came out in the spring of 2017, talked about how outdated the computer system was. It's a COBOL system for those of you that are sci-fi nerds. Yes, that is a planet on Battlestar Galactica. It's also a, a computer program that is significantly outdated. The system should have really been replaced entirely in 2006. It was on life support uh, at, at, in a, the best case scenario when we completed our audit in 2017. And what we said then and what I said and when we released our audit is this system cannot is not prepared for the next recession. Now, I would say in fairness, no system would have been prepared for the onslaught that happened over these last couple of weeks with the pandemic. But the staff there have been entirely overwhelmed because the computer system is entirely outdated. My understanding is that the new system will be in place by October 1st. The previous vendor has been fired, um, but still, there are a lot of people hurting and not getting their checks on time through no fault of their own, simply because of an outdated computer system. As federal stimulus funds are released and various loan programs are being administered, what role will your office have in making sure that these programs are being distributed and conducted fairly? Anything comes directly from the federal government to individuals. We don't have any jurisdiction there. That's not my role. But any money that flows from the federal government to the state, and there's going to be a lot of aid to the states, um, you know, economic development programs, things to try to help keep small businesses afloat. We obviously can audit the Department of Banking. Our job is to make sure that that money is going where it's supposed to. So if it's fl if flowing through any state entity, we want to make sure that that's being done for exactly what it's intended to do, which is making sure small businesses that, that qualify are able to stay open and also making sure that the aid to the states is used to make sure that we're not laying off uh, you know, teachers across Pennsylvania and certainly our first responders as well. You'd also called for greater transparency in the number of COVID-19 deaths, particularly involving Pennsylvania's veterans' homes. What were your concerns? 
Well, the, it's particularly in Chester County, we were uh, reviewing the data from a uh, veterans home in Chester County, and we've audited veterans homes in the past where we've been concerned about the staff to patient ratio, and even where we'd have some regions where there'd be a lot of uh, vacant beds in some regions of the state where they'd be overstaffed and they weren't letting the veterans know uh, where some of the available beds were. So that was concerning in our last audit. And the administration did a good job of fixing a lot of those issues, particularly in this Chester County one, we were concerned that the death toll was skyrocketing. And we were, and so we're going to be investing and see how it's skyrocketing. Again, there may be, and again, you never know, there may be reasons that were beyond the staff's control or beyond the management's cons uh, control. But we want to make sure that that the staff there and the veterans are getting every amount of protection they can. Um, when you see some of these spikes, it lets you know something might have gone wrong there. We want to make sure that, A, we can at least try to stop it where it is in that veteran's home and make sure it doesn't uh, occur in other veteran's homes as well. Overall, how would you rate how the Wolf administration has handled the COVID-19 pandemic in Pennsylvania? I think they've done, I think the governor and his team have done about as good a job as you can have. Certainly there's issues like the business waiver program um, that, that you know, we're going to obviously have an independent investigation on. Um, the governor uh, himself and myself, we've all done things that you would agree with and things you've disagreed with because we've not gone through anything like this. But I think he's handled this about as well as it could be handled. Auditor General Eugene De Pasquale, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much and great to, great to see you and stay safe out there. PCN is committed to providing the people of Pennsylvania with the most up-to-the-minute information about coronavirus. Daily special programming with civic, business, and government leaders and how COVID-19 is affecting the community. Airing weekdays at noon and 8 p.m. Live special coverage of the governor and the Secretary of Health, as well as programming designed to inform and assist everyone impacted. Go to PCNTV.com for the latest information. I'm joined today by Senator John DeSanto. Senator is chair of the Senate State Government Committee. You recently held a hearing to consider primary election concerns during this era of the pandemic. What kind of specific concerns did you hear at the hearing? Well, thank you for having me, Francine. And uh, yes, we did have a hearing today. We had a broad range of uh, presenters, uh, Secretary of uh, Department of State, county election officials, and some national experts. And uh, the real issue that we were dealing with today is to try to determine if we should leave the Pennsylvania primary as is on June 2nd with mail-in and in-person voting or move it to a all mail-in uh, voting option. And the third option would be to move it from the June 2nd date. So that was the purpose of the hearing. So besides delaying the primary election to June 2nd, what other accommodations have been made thus far uh, for election bureaus? Uh, well, when we did the uh, election reforms earlier in the year, you know, we permitted mail-in balloting. Um, we've also, uh, which is different from absentee balloting. It's called no excuse voting. If you want to vote by mail, you could do that. In addition, we made some changes for the county election officials to when they could start opening uh, ballots and uh, generally things like that. Uh, and also, another big one was polling place flexibility, allowing to... Uh, do that, which was helpful. You had mentioned uh, that there are some legislative proposals to move this to an all mail in election. Have you taken a position on that? Well, there's no real proposals yet. There's just a lot of discussion and there's no clear consensus on which way uh, this needs to go uh, by party or county officials. So uh, the hearing was very well attended today. Uh, I'm in the process of continuing to get input because uh, no matter what we do, there's a lot of complexity and issues around whichever decision is made. Uh, we do, in my opinion, have to make a decision next week because the county officials are under tremendous pressure to perform because at the heart of this matter is that we have to make sure that our election process is safe for the poll workers and our voters and that we keep the integrity of our election process. Assuming that county elections will still have at least some in-person component, what kind of special accommodations do you anticipate will need to be made? Well, there's uh, a lot of talk, obviously, about distancing, masks, gloves, things like that. Uh, there are certain voters that need to vote in person, and there are voters that, you know, believe it's their right 
to vote in person and don't uh, necessarily have the confidence of the mail-in option. So I think if there's proper social distancing and, um, you know, everybody takes the proper precautions, we can do that. And the State Department is providing um, personal protection equipment as well. Is there a cost benefit over all mail-in ballots versus the traditional in-person manner of voting? You know, I've not seen any factual information on that yet. And I, no matter what happens, I don't think in this instance with this election cycle, we can make any inferences uh, on cost savings or cost overruns just because there's been so many changes and with COVID-19, it, it's definitely a unique time. If there is in-person voting allowed, some polling places may consolidate and even relocate. Um, keeping that in mind, are there any special accommodations that have been discussed to make sure that voters are not disenfranchised if this occurs? Well, there's already been a number of counties that have consolidated their, their voting um, polling places, and they have taken the precautions that they need. Everybody's uh, issues are different. Obviously, center city polling locations are different from rural polling locations. And, and I think that's where our county officials really shine. They do what they need to do to provide the, a, a safe uh, voting and accessible voting environment for their constituents. There's been some talk and concern also regarding voter fraud. In your opinion, is there any reason to believe that there may be a greater incidence of voter fraud if people vote via ballot as opposed to traditional in-person methods? Well, voter fraud is a real concern, and I think that uh, states that have implemented this have implemented it over time uh, and done it in a way that it becomes uh, f hopefully as fraud-proof as it can be. However, there are numerous uh, instances throughout the country where uh, mail-in balloting is fraught with voter fraud, and we need to make sure that does not happen to keep the integrity of our system. Perhaps from a broader perspective, what is your opinion on the job that the administration has done in mitigating this pandemic in Pennsylvania? Well, I think the governor and Secretary Levine are, you know, doing what they think uh, is best. I have serious issues with the way they have done it. Uh, I believe that life-sustaining, non-life-sustaining is not proper. I think that we should be doing safe versus unsafe. And I think that the um, business waiver process has been confusing. Uh, there's been uh, no clear answers on that. The governor and Secretary Levine refuse to answer questions on that. Uh, the Department of Health numbers on COVID deaths and percentages are constantly changing. There's a lot of confusion around there and not much transparency. And I think it would be in everybody's interest to work on that. Auditor General Eugene DePasquale today said that he is willing to undertake an audit of the Department of Community and Economic Development and the waiver program that you just referenced for businesses that wanted to continue to operate during the business shutdowns of the pandemic. What are your expectations of this audit? Well, I applaud uh, him for doing that. However, uh, you know, the Senate Veterans and Depart uh, Veterans Affairs Committee is going to issue a subpoena requiring that information. And I believe uh, that was done in conjunction with the governor, the uh, um, auditor general, to try to head off that subpoena because they have refused to provide that information. And that's very disheartening because that information is available. It's been provided to law enforcement through JNET uh, so that they can uh, cite businesses, but yet they refuse to uh, release it to the legislature. And we are the ones that are getting inundated by our constituents with legitimate questions. Why am I not allowed to open my business and my competitor down the street is? Why can big box stores be open, but a small business can't if they do uh, social distancing? Before I let you go, one last question. What kind of legislation would you like to see continue to move through the Senate to help your constituents address some of the effects of this pandemic? Well, honestly, I would like to see more transparency and the governor sit down with the legislature and, and get these businesses open as quickly as possible. Legislation takes time. It never gets everything 100% right. And I think this is an opportunity that's being squandered by the governor and, and uh, not on the legislature's part, but sitting down and deciding quickly how we can reopen the businesses in Pennsylvania that uh, support families are really hurting. You look at states like Florida and California, they did not 
closed down nearly as tight as we have, and their um, instances of coronavirus infection and deaths are not that statistically different than us, but our economy is in a lot worse shape. Senator John DeSanto, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Francine. Join our guests for insights on issues impacting local government and the citizens of Pennsylvania. Created by the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs, Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs connects you to legislation and policy that will affect you and your family. Your host, Chris Kapp, and his guests discuss current affairs that matter to you most. Connect with your state by tuning into Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs on Sundays here on PCN. Dr. William Height is the superintendent of the School District of Philadelphia. Dr. Height, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Corey. Um, can you just give us a rundown or a, maybe an update? What is the current state of instruction in the schools in the city of Philadelphia? Yeah, we're currently into our continuity of education plan, and the continuity of education plan had three phases. The first phase was printed materials that we were providing for all students at some of our 49 meal distribution sites. The second phase is the enrichment and review. This is all on previously covered material. But the second phase is on a digital platform and it is teacher-led enrichment and review. And it's gonna move into planned instruction, which begins on Monday, May 4th. And that's when we will be introducing new content that will also be teacher-led there will be some grades, but grades are meant to help children and not to punish them. And so we will be introducing some new material from May 4th until we conclude our school year, June 12th. And how prepared are you for that, um, that uh, May 4th date? Yeah, we feel, we feel better prepared than we were when this first started back in, in mid-March. Since that period of time, we have now had 7,000 of our 96, roughly 9,600 teachers go through training on the utilizing the digital platform. We have distributed some 81,000 Chromebooks to families and to students who need one. We are in the process of also distributing some mobile hotspots, although a much lower number to children who are most in need. Those are children generally in our homeless shelters. Um, and so we feel more prepared than we were before with an understanding that this is not gonna be a sufficient replacement for direct instruction where a teacher is face-to-face -face with a student on a daily basis. How many students were in need of those computers and how many students even had internet access? Yeah, so we're still, we're still figuring out the internet access question we, as I indicated before, some 81,000 Chromebooks have been distributed. So that we think that's a pretty significant need while some families already had a computer that was for use for their children at the, in the home. The distinction here, Corey, is that each child in the household needs their own machine and they need their own machine because the, it, it is quite possible the elementary student is doing work at the same time the middle school student is doing work at the same time the high school student may be doing work. And so where one household may have had one computer for all of their children to use, and in some cases, in many cases, that was also shared with the family who are in some cases also working from home now, we wanted to make sure that we were distributing the technology so that every single student had access to that. And we have seen in the distribution schools that run the gamut. We have some schools where 100% of their students uh, took advantage of the Chromebooks, and it goes all the way down to schools with 3% of the students who are taking advantage. And so it varies based on what the children and their families and the communities need. And where did these computers come from? Yeah, so we had some computers already that we redistributed from our schools. Those were computers that we had as classroom sets. 
classroom labs and they were just available in many of our schools. So we had to go in inventory, collect those and then redistribute those. In addition to those, we purchased another 40,000 brand new machines um, to actually go with the inventory that we already had. And so between the 40,000 computers that were purchased, plus the computers that already existed in schools, those were the ones that we used to then distribute to all of the families um, and the students who indicated a need. So that brings us to the funding aspect. Um, can you just tell our statewide audience, uh, how, are, uh, how is your school district funded? Yeah, so we may be the only school district in the Commonwealth, Corey, that are, that we do, where we do not control, or have the ability to generate our own revenue. And so our revenue comes primarily from the state uh, or the Commonwealth, and then the, the, other, the, the, the other revenue comes from the city government. And so it is budgeted by the mayor of the city of Philadelphia, appropriated by city council, and so about 51% of our revenue comes from the Commonwealth. Uh, another uh, 49% comes from the city of Philadelphia. And so most of our revenue is generated by many of the things that will likely be impacted uh, during this pandemic. And so what, what is the latest at this point uh, as far as how your funding has been impacted? Yeah, so we're going to lose um, on we're, we're going to lose about uh, sixty million dollars in revenue that we would have received from this point to the end of the school year, and so we're projecting a loss of about sixty million dollars, and that's just from local tax sources that uh, that have not been able to be collected because of the circumstances surrounding uh, the COVID nineteen. Uh, those are lots of local taxes. Those are liquor by the drink. Uh, the, all of the restaurants are closed so that no one is doing that. Monies from PPA, ride share, use and occupancy, all of those things have been impacted by uh, the inability to have an economy that's operating and the fact that we are practicing a physical distancing and, and trying to flatten the curve. So all our current year's funding will be impacted about by about $60 million. Fortunately for us, we have worked over the years very hard to create uh, a, a, a much better fiscal picture. And as a result, we've had a balanced budget for the last five years, and we had three credit upgrades, and we are now at investment grade, and we've had a fund balance. And so we're using that fund balance to offset uh, what we will likely lose this year, and will also offset what we're projecting as uh, a significant, it will help offset next year, uh, what we're projecting as a significant deficit as we know revenues will be reduced both locally and from the state. And you, um, you had a briefing this morning, you mentioned you were part of a consortium that reached out to Congress for additional funding. Can you talk about that? We did, and so um, as a as a urban as a large urban district, we are part of an organization called the Council of Great City Schools. These are urban districts in all the largest cities across the country, and 61 of us uh, signed off on a letter to Congress, and that letter was asking for an additional 175 billion dollars to come directly to schools and school districts, particularly in urban centers, school districts that have have in many cases generated more spending as a result of trying to respond to the pandemic. And so many districts are purchasing technology. They are trying to make sure we have the ability to distribute meals. We're making sure that we are connecting young people to services and supports. We're sanitizing buildings. And so all of those things are adding costs, Corey, that when we know we're gonna have reduced revenues moving forward. And so the request to Congress was to have, if they're gonna explore another package, another stimulus package, then we wanted to make sure that as urban school districts in the, the largest cities around the country, we were also requesting their support for what we know will be a tough road ahead. 
So uh, briefly, let's just talk about the planned instruction that begins on, on May 4th. What will that look like? Is it going to be students will sit down in front of their computers at 9 a.m. and then have instruction from prof- teachers all day? Or what, what, will it, what will a typical day look like? So, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you asked that question. So it is, we, we actually developed with, with a teacher's union, the PFT, and with multiple individuals, uh, what a day would look like in terms of the plan instruction. And we now have a, a digital web page where anyone could go on that web page and see what every child in every grade will be working on on every day. And we, in that work, we are asking our teachers to, to have, to connect with students in an instructional mode for at least three hours every day. Um, in addition to that, I have office hours for students and their families. And this is what the recognition that both our staff members and our students are also dealing with a unique set of circumstances. Many are taking care of other siblings in the household. Many of our staff members also have children who are at home as well. So the planned instruction is a mixture of things that will be guided by the teacher. And, and it's a mixture of things that students can do on their own but it will be teacher led. It will be assignments and participation that we are gonna be asking uh, the young people to be involved with. And we will then do that uh, from Monday, May 4th, through the end of the school year for us, which is June 12th. Um, So just to wrap up, uh, how much have you looked forward to summer school and then maybe returning in the fall? Yeah, we have a work group now that is planning for what school could look like or what this could look like when we return. And we are planning for all types of contingencies, Corey. We are also looking at the summer planning. And as it stands now, it looks like we will still be in, still be utilizing a digital format, at least through the summer. Uh, we, we are, we're exploring Uh, as well with other school districts uh, across the Commonwealth and across the country, what this could look like moving forward uh, next fall. And as I mentioned, we're planning for all types of contingencies, whether we can actually start uh, when we normally start. If we stop, if we start and then have to stop, uh, then what does that look like? What do the calendars look like um, for for all of us to be to all of us consider. And so all of those things are part of what the working group is planning for now. And there's a lot still to be determined that we will have to work through. I said on an earlier call today that uh, some 70,000 children in the the city of Philadelphia take SEPTA to and from school. And so we have to consider all of those things. And that's not just the school district of Philadelphia, that's all the charter schools and the archdiocesan schools that all take SEPTA once children hit the seventh grade. So that's still another part of the consideration uh, for what these environments and these structures and, and programs and processes and systems will look like if in fact we have to do some form of distancing and making sure that children and staff members are safe. All right. Well, Dr. William Height, thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Corey. It's a pleasure.